Uh, Jennifer Frederigo from the University of Illinois is going to be talking about feedbacks between non-native grass invasion and fire. There's a lot of mics. Okay. Okay. So I want to start out talking about fire a little bit. Probably to this audience, it comes as no surprise um, if I, I tell you that fire plays a really important role in maintaining the structure and function, especially of mixed oak forests in, the East, in Eastern North America. And, and this has become broadly recognized, I would say, within the past three to four decades. And it's been, um, the recognition of this has been very much supported by historical reconstructions of fire activity across the eastern U.S. So this is work from Mike Stambaugh, where they've reconstructed fire histories for a variety of sites shown here, and shown that in many places, including Illinois, fire was a very important part of uh, ecological systems and was important for, again, maintaining uh, certain types of um, uh, forests, in particular, again, mixed uh, oak forests. So, so we, these are uh, uh, mean fire intervals. So essentially, you can think of this as a return interval. So in southern Illinois, it um, looks like the return interval was somewhere between four and eight years. <clears throat> Whoops. OK. So a problem then has been fire has been suppressed uh, over the past several decades as well. Uh, this shows, this is work from Nowicki and Adam, Abram, sorry, showing uh, essentially across the eastern U.S. the change in magnitude um, from previous times uh, to current times in terms of the fire regime. So um, overall, most areas in the eastern, in eastern U.S. have um, had reduced fire activity over time. And this can lead to a problem, essentially, of forest being shifted from uh, more of a xeric type of species composition to mesophytic species. So these are um, essentially um, called ball and cup diagrams, showing the shift in these different ecosystem states and how hard it is to reverse a state from uh, one to another position. So uh, on the top here, you can see that with different, differing amounts of fire frequency, we tend to have oak savanna, oak woodland, or oak forest. Um, and if we remove fire, we drop into this area of mesophytic hardwoods. And the distance between this cup to this cup is, is um, the barrier to it is this distance over um, this hump, suggesting that it's very hard to reverse this state. And that's shown further that when we remove, remove fire from these systems, we drop systems into this mesophytic state, and it's very hard to go back to an oak system, an oak-dominated system. OK, so fire clearly is important. We're recognizing this. We have lots of historical evidence to support it. Um, and that has all led to now an uptick in the amount of fire activity. So there's been a lot of interest in returning fire to the landscape. This is shown um, in this National Prescribed Fire Use Survey report. Uh, you can see, again, Illinois has shown an increase in the amount of um, fire acres, so essentially places where there's um, uh, surface fire activity. Uh, and I mentioned this is from uh, 2015. So uh, over 3.6 million hectares of forest land in the U.S. are currently being burned, and, and um, a good portion of that is happening in Illinois. All right, this is a, a, a invasive species symposium. So here's where invasive species fit in, right? They present a very significant challenge to returning fire to these landscapes. So one thing, and I'll talk more in detail about this now, um, you can see that happens when we have invasives is we really change the uh, potentially the fuel conditions in forests. So this is a, a photo from Chris Evans um, showing the invasion of Microstegium viminium, Japanese stiltgrass, which is a species I'll be talking about today. This is from Fort Massac uh, in far southern Illinois. <clears throat> So the invasion of these systems in, 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 together with fire can lead to what's been referred to as the grass fire cycle. So uh, let's just walk through this here. We have uh, initially a system that's invaded, could be for a variety of reasons, but often it's been disturbed in some way, and that triggers the initial establishment of an invasive species, in this case, and it's this annual grass microstegium that I'll talk more about in a minute. Um, and that can lead to an altered uh, fuel load. 
Um, it can increase the amount of fuels, but it also changes the architecture of those fuels, and that can lead to potentially uh, higher fire intensity, so an overall change in fire behavior, so a shift compared to what would have um, been the typical fire behavior without invasion. And that can have a couple different uh, effects. One is it can actually lead to more severe invasions, so I'll present evidence supporting that pathway. And it could also um, have this effect on the regeneration of native woody species. So that's particularly important in the sense that, again, if surface fires are being used to either maintain or restore these um, uh, oak, mixed oak systems, and now we have invasion leading to greater fire intensity, that could have negative effects on the regeneration of native species. So, so it's a, a, a very um, important concern. Uh, that led us to this body of research that I'll be discussing today. The other thing I want to mention is by promoting invasion, we could also have negative effects on native uh, regeneration because there is um, this issue of competition that we've heard a little bit about already today. So I'll come back to that. <clears throat> okay, so this is the species I'm going to talk about um, in the context of grass invasion, fire, and tree regeneration, and that's Japanese stiltcrest. So just to introduce you to the species, if you don't know about it too much yet, it's um, a shade, fairly shade tolerant annual C4 grass. So most of our grasses in uh, this, these systems are C3 grasses, so this one's somewhat unique in terms of its photosynthetic pathway. Um, it, it produces a lot of seed, which is probably part of the reason it's so successful, um, and it, those seeds persist in the seed bank for about five years. Uh, it also has some advantages in terms of its phenology. It greens up early, around April or May, so before a lot of other species are active in these systems, it can begin fixing carbon. Um, <clears throat> and then flowers late in the season, September, October, and doesn't senesce until October, November. So it has this extended period of time over which it's, it's um, biologically active. And I should mention that it's native to Asia and was introduced to the U.S. in um, 1920 as packing material. Um, okay. So um, again, I'm going to present results from a couple of different studies. The overall question here being addressed is, does grass invasion modulate the outcomes of prescribed fire for mixed oak forests in the central hardwoods region? Um, so the first question I'll, I'll be um, presenting results for is how does grass invasion affect fuels, fire behavior, grass performance, and then the fire effects on tree regeneration. <coughs> and then I'll also talk about if we repeatedly burn areas, does that have different um, outcomes in terms of this feedback between invasion and fire, since in, in, uh, repeated fire is one of the uh, main management strategies being used by land managers. <clears throat> So this work I'm going to talk about was all conducted in southern Illinois. The first set of studies were conducted mainly in the eastern portion of the Shawnee National Forest at a range of different sites, um, but primarily uh, in Pope <coughs> County, Illinois. And then in subsequent studies, we've worked in other parts of um, uh, the, the uh, other counties to the west. So I'll talk about that in a minute. OK, I'm going to just jump right in then with some results. So the first part of this is, again, how do fuels change? And there are many different ways to measure fuels. We quantified fuel loads. This is woody fuels, in particular using Brown's transects. We basically saw no difference in terms of the um, amount of woody fuels or the composition of woody fuels um, in these invaded and uninvaded areas. So the, the, the blue would be the uninvaded reference areas, and the red bars here would be our invaded areas. Um, but we did see differences in terms of the environmental conditions and the litter moisture that correspond with the types of conditions or habitats in which um, stiltgrass is most successful. So we saw essentially stiltgrass being um, uh, invaded areas uh, having higher litter moisture. And we know that already stiltgrass does well in these high moisture conditions. So that didn't really come as a surprise. We also found that um, stiltgrass was uh, more abundant in places where litter biomass was lower. Again, not a surprise. Previous studies have shown that where the forest floor is um, uh, uh, lower, um, thinner, then we see higher uh, levels of invasion. <clears throat> OK, so um, what does this mean for fire behavior? So if we try to link information about um, 
the um, fuels, we didn't see those, any strong differences in fuels, but again, those Browns transects focus on woody fuels, but we know that in the, um, the senesced material of microstegium itself can affect fire. What do we see? Well, when we just look at maximum fire temperature in degrees Celsius, we actually see higher maximum fire temperatures in our uninvaded stands. Um, I will mention that when this study was conducted, it wasn't a great year for fire. It was less conducive. It had been wet and kind of cool uh, when the fires were um, uh, uh, being conducted. And this, I should mention, too, is done together with the um, uh, burn crew in the Shawnee National Forest. So we were just kind of um, choosing sites that they had already planned to burn. Um, and so this would have been their typical burn uh, regime in these forests. So overall, we see lower maximum fire temperatures in invaded stands. Um, and if we look at these data continuously, we see, as we would expect, again, in the reference stands overall, as moisture increases, fire temperature declines. That certainly makes sense. The opposite pattern, though, uh, was true for invaded areas. And what we think is happening, again, in these high moisture areas, that's where we actually see greater biomass. So, so we think that, you know, eventually as we get to high moisture, high biomass conditions, that overrides that dampening effect of moisture on fire. So, so it is possible, um, or we do see evidence to suggest that um, higher microstegium biomass can lead to greater fire intensity. Um, we see sort of weaker patterns when we look at residence time. So this would be the amount of time that a fire burns really hot, in this case over 60 degrees Celsius, which is the temperature at which plant cell death can occur. So this is an important threshold. Um, and again, we see higher residence times uh, for the uninvaded stands as compared to the invaded stands, but a very similar pattern um, in that that declines in the reference stands with high moisture. Um, or with increasing moisture, and it's, it's um, a lot shallower, steep or, um, um, gradient uh, for the invaded areas and getting to the point where, where we have high biomass under these high litter moisture conditions, um, we see actually the residence time creep up a little bit over the reference conditions. Okay, what does this mean in terms of how it affects future invasion? Again, so this idea of the feedback between fire and invasion. Um, this is work from a previous graduate student, Stephanie Wagner, um, and we found that overall fire does in fact promote invasion. So we see higher, this is um, biomass of microstegium viminium. Um, we see higher biomass in burned areas shown by the dashed line here. And you can see that's amplified with soil moisture, which is on the x-axis here. So higher soil moisture in these sites um, that are burned leads to very, very big flushes of biomass following the fire in the next growing season. Okay, so this is sort of this effect of fire in a, um, from one growing season to the next. And you can see it's a much flatter slope for our unburned stands. Um, we also measure performance in terms of seed production. So again, telling us something about whether or not this invasion will be maintained since this is an annual plant. Seed production is critical. And again, seeds per stalk increased uh, pretty steeply um, in the burned areas with soil moisture. And we see a much flatter um, type of response with soil moisture under those uh, conditions where there was no burning. So again, overall suggesting fires having positive effects on the um, biomass and the seed production, the overall performance of Japanese stiltgrass, which is amplified by moisture. <clears throat> um, if we look at whether fire reduces the seed bank in any way, which we may think is a positive thing, right? We, we unfortunately don't see uh, much support for that. So we did some germination trials in the greenhouse where we collected soils from areas that had been invaded and either burned or didn't burn. And the top um, solid line is the control, and the bottom dash line is the stands that burned. So from before the fire till after the fire, we did see a decline in seedling emergence, but that was pretty much matched by the overall effective time of seedling emergence in the non-burn stands, suggesting fire isn't really having much of a, an effect on the seed bank at all. And these, again, are low-intensity surface fires, so it's quite possible they're just not getting hot enough to kill um, these seeds and make them you know, non-viable. 
Okay, so now I want to talk about the woody natives, since that was one of the things I mentioned is an you know, important reason for this study. So if we just look at before fire, what's the um, uh, relationship between invasion and the amount or density of seedlings, woody seedlings. So this is across all the species that we encountered. Um, this is seedlings per uh, uh, square meter. And you can see there's an overall negative relationship between stiltgrass biomass and um, the number of seedlings in a given area, okay? Suggesting, again, there's some negative effect of the uh, invasive species abundance, Japanese stiltgrass abundance on woody seedlings. <clears throat> What if we look at this between uh, fire events? So we tagged individuals and then tagged them before fire and then went back and remeasured them. So, so located them again and, and remeasured to determine whether they were, um, uh, had persisted um, either in terms of overall survival, evidence for resprouting, or whether they died. Um, and we see that in the um, invaded areas, survival. Um, level of resprouting was lower. So this is post-fire, um, suggesting that invasion and fire together leads to an overall decline in the number of or the proportion of um, native woody species. And you can also see the increase in the number that died um, due to that fire. So um, there is some positive news, I guess, on this front, and that is that the size of those individuals really had a strong effect on whether or not um, it was able to survive the fire. So overall, um, we saw that larger individuals were uh, uh, able to tolerate or withstand um, fire even in the invaded stands. So this is diameter on the x-axis and persistence again from that pre-fire to post-fire uh, time. And um, I just added the one thing I wanted to draw your attention to was essentially that, you know, 50%, so about half of the individual's survival rate here, uh, you can see is around three uh, meters in diameter size seedlings for the unburned condition, for, I'm sorry, for the uninvaded conditions. And for the invaded conditions, you have to be quite a bit larger to reach that 50% survival rate. Okay, so there is a, a doubling approximately um, of the size that's required to survive or, or suggest um, survival um, at 50% levels. Okay, so just to summarize, no difference in those woody fuel loads and overall lower fire intensity in the invaded stands consistent with the higher moisture conditions and higher uh, microstegium invasion. Positive feedback between fire and grass invasions. Um, again, moisture amplifying this effect. And lower seedling density and post-fire seedling survival in the invaded stands. So the fire effect diminishes, though, with seedling size. So you might be scratching your head, though, um, at these two results, because they seem a little bit counterintuitive. Lower fire intensity in invaded stands, and yet uh, lower post-fire survival. Why is that? So one of the things um, I mentioned early on is that we can imagine that this increase in fire intensity can have negative effects on survival, right? That's one pathway by which um, invasion and fire interact to affect native regeneration. But another pathway, again, that I mentioned is these direct effects of invasion. So if fire promotes invasion, this could also have very negative effects just through, say, resource competition. So we wanted to try to use our data to address whether one of those two pathways was more supported. Um, and we found evidence or support for this idea that those direct effects are actually playing a bigger role in persistence than um, fire intensity. So this is a structural equation model. There's a lot going on here, and what I want to draw your attention to is just these um, underlined values. So these you can think of as the relative support for a given pathway. So um, fire intensity, as you can see, as we'd expect, there's a negative relationship with soil moisture. Fire intensity declines as moisture increases. That makes sense. There's a positive relationship between moisture and microstegium biomass. That makes sense. We found in this study a negative relationship between biomass and fire intensity. So as biomass increases, um, fire intensity declines, and that's, again, probably due to this moisture relationship. And overall, there's a negative effect of fire intensity on seedling persistence. Okay, that, that makes sense. If it's a hotter fire, you should have fewer individuals surviving. 
But you can see the weight of the evidence suggests that there's a stronger role for the actual direct effects of microstegium biomass on seedling persistence. Again, supporting this idea that it's this direct effects, probably through resource competition, that's leading to um, less ability of these seedlings to tolerate fire. Okay. <clears throat> Okay, so um, just to mention, because I think it's important, again, for this audience to consider that there has been other work showing that um, fire and invasion, and particularly invasion by microstegium viminium, can have these very adverse effects on woody seedlings. And this work was conducted by Luke Flory and others um, in central Indiana, and they showed that fire reduced um, survival of planted trees. So that's one difference between our study and their study was they were using trees that they had planted. Those trees most likely had fewer reserves in terms of the amount of carbohydrates stored in their roots and may have been less able to uh, recover from fire as compared to the um, individuals that naturally recolonized in our study. So that could be one reason that they saw such strong negative effects and the, the effects that we found were much uh, weaker. Another difference is they were working in a system where they were burning the fires at sort of the most fire conducive times of the year, so hot, dry conditions. They saw very intense fires as compared to the system where we worked, which those burns were mainly happening during the dormant season, which tend to be cooler and wetter. So the fire intensity was lower. So that's just one thing to keep in mind. Um, when considering um, you know, these two studies together. So I'm going to spend just a little bit of time at addressing this question of how does repeated fire affect the feedback between invasion um, and fire. So this work um, is conducted also in southern Illinois, but this time in Dixon Springs State Park and Giant City State Park. Um, and this is work uh, done, led by Mara Rembelski. So this, uh, these two sites differed mainly in terms of their burn histories. So Dixon Springs State Park has a history of repeated burning. Um, the fire return interval was approximately four to five years. Um, over about 20 year time period, whereas Giant City State Park really had no history of burning at all. So we had a design where we um, introduced fire uh, in small plots here, paired those with plots that were not burned in that particular year. But again, this is overlaid on top of this fire or burn history. So this allowed us to address this question, though, of, of again, the role of fire history as well as a one-time fire. So I want to come back to this model of the grass fire cycle and introduce one more player here, and that is nitrogen. So nitrogen is important in this story because we know from previous studies that microstegium tends to like not only moist conditions, but high fertility uh, conditions, so places where there is ample nitrogen availability. Now, one thing it's important to think about is the role of fire uh, in, in, in nitrogen availability. So fire can um, essentially lead to nitrogen loss um, from systems. So it kind of has these different effects. And initially, it can convert organic nitrogen to inorganic nitrogen. And if there's plants or microbes there to take up that inorganic nitrogen, it can stay in the system. Um, so that's often why fire produces this pulse of biomass and growth initially. But in many cases, like where we have these dormant season burns, um, there's nothing to take up that nitrogen once it's converted to inorganic forms. And those forms are very mobile. In other words, they can, they can leave the system if there's a big rain event or, or um, uh, something else that causes them to be, to be, something else that causes the inorganic nitrogen to be washed away. So that's one pathway by which nitrogen can be lost. Another pathway is by combustion itself. So if these fires are hot enough, we can actually have um, volatilization of that nitrogen and it can leave the system in gaseous forms. So, so nitrogen could actually be depleted through um, uh, fire. And again, if we have evidence that invasion is increasing fire intensity, that may lead to greater losses. 
And over time, we hypothesized that that could actually have a negative feedback on invasion. Because if these species really prefer areas where there's abundant nitrogen available, and now we have nitrogen being lost from the system, perhaps over time we actually may see that in terms of, the, um, uh, in terms of a reduction in the severity of the invasion. So I'm going to really just talk about this side of this cycle um, in the next few slides. So um, we went out, the royal we went out, um, and sampled these communities that had different burn histories. Um, and again, I'm just going to focus on the microstegium biomass results. So this is, um, uh, these are results showing the differences in above ground biomass. So that is just the shoots part. Um, so we've got, again, these different things going on. We've got the two different sites, Sticks and Springs, where we have the repeated burning, and Giant City, where there's really no history of burning. And then the two different colored bars in each case refer to whether it was sort of our control ambient conditions or whether it had um, there had been a one-time burn um, in the, in the um, winter, uh, early spring period. And what we see is overall this pretty big difference in terms of above ground biomass of stilt grass between Dixon Springs and Giant City. So there's no big difference between the, the treatments that one time burned, but big differences between the sites um, it, uh, aligning with those differences in fire history. So much less biomass in the repeatedly burned sites. Um, and this is the... Um, ratio of carbon to nitrogen that we measure in the above ground biomass, so in the shoot itself. And what we see is a lot more carbon relative to nitrogen in the shoots of the stilt grass in this repeatedly burned site as compared to the um, site with no fire history. Okay, um, we look below ground too, so that's the shoots. What about the roots? The roots show um, a consistent pattern in terms of potentially supporting the story of nitrogen limitation. So fine roots, you can see there's much greater um, carbon investment, so just the amount of fine root biomass is much greater in the Dixon Springs study site, which is the site, again, that had been repeatedly burned over 20 years. So in other words, plants are investing a lot of energy and carbon in producing roots. And one reason they may do that, again, is because if nitrogen is limiting, they're going to need to explore more volume of soil in order to um, take up more nitrogen to support their growth. So, so these shifts in sort of plant allocation of carbon um, are in line with this notion that nitrogen could be more limiting or is more limiting at Dixon Springs as compared to Giant City. The carbon to nitrogen ratio of the fine roots also supports that, so we see more carbon relative to nitrogen, again, in Dixon Springs relative to Giant City. So, so overall, suggesting you know, less nitrogen being available here um, as compared to Giant City. Um, and if we look at the two, the biomass and the shoots compared to the biomass and the roots, um, or I'm sorry, the other way around, biomass in the roots compared to the shoots, similar patterns emerge in the repeatedly burned sites have overall much higher biomass in the roots as compared to the shoots, okay? So just the difference in these lines, and we see very weak effects of that one-time burn on this pattern. Okay, to summarize those results then, repeated burning led to a greater effect than one-time burning, and also we see evidence of a larger investment in the roots versus the shoots, consistent with nitrogen limitation. <clears throat> Shoot and root C to N ratios also support that line um, in terms of uh, there being higher C to N ratios in the repeatedly burned sites. So just to conclude, Across all these studies, we've seen that grass invasion, um, there is evidence that it can increase fire intensity when conditions are conducive to fire. So again, mainly from these studies that have been done in Indiana, whereas our work, which follows more of the, the burn uh, regime being used by the Forest Service and other land managers, really doesn't show that strong of an effect of microstegium on fire intensity, largely because those fires are happening at a time of year which are less conducive to very hot fires. Also, it seems to be the case, based on um, our evidence, that the direct negative effects are much stronger and outweigh those of the effects of fire intensity um, on persistence of woody seedlings. So grass invasions have this direct negative effect um, on post-fire persistence. And this, like I said, could be very much related to resource competition. Um, as I pointed out, those indirect effects were present but smaller. 
and contingent on seedling size. And then finally, it, uh, our evidence suggests that infrequent fire, while it promotes grass invasion, repeated burning is actually weakening this grass fire feedback. I do want to just mention the caveat that these species persist in the understory. They're just not as vigorous invasions um, after repeated burning, but they're still present. Okay. And just to acknowledge people who've assisted with this work and uh, support from different funding agencies. And if I don't know how I am on time, if there's time or not for questions. Got a couple, yeah, a couple we'll minutes. A couple okay. So if there are questions, um, feel free. Yeah. Um, you talked about your fire and that impacts the tree seedling persistence. Yes. Um, did you see a difference on like, functional groups of seedlings species. or species? Right. We looked for species effects. We really didn't see strong evidence. Um, you know, we specifically we expected that there would be um, larger effects on your fire intolerance species, but it seems to be really overridden by that size threshold. So, you know, it, there just wasn't much variation. Now, I, I know that in the Flurry study, they saw some bigger differences between species. We just didn't see much of that. Yeah. How are you measuring maximum fire temperature? Um, using thermocouples with data loggers. So we had them in, in, you know, located in different parts of the burn unit that was going to be um, uh, burned. And um, they were at right above ground level. Yeah, so capturing kind of surface fire intensity. Yeah, it's a good question. Um, and we also, I, I didn't present these results, but did other things like use um, the, um, uh, those sort of flame height indicators, um, you know, hung at different places in the in the area that was burned, um, and then, like I said, measured, extracted different information from the um, logged uh, thermocouple data. Maybe one more. Yeah. Yes. I'm not sure if you addressed this, but with the, the seedling survival, um, is it possible that in the um, Uninvaded areas, there's just a less consistent fuel. Um, so, like, there's a blanket of fuel where it's uh, invaded versus yes. like just a leaflet, or so maybe there's more refugia in there for the right. As well. Right. I think that is absolutely, you know, a possibility. And in fact, um, in this other study that was published, that was one of the hypotheses that even though we didn't directly measure it, we think that invasion essentially leads to more continuous fuel loads. You know, so it's connecting the fuels. In other words. Um, so it makes it more easy. And we did see evidence, um, so I didn't present this, but in terms of the extent of the area burned, so invaded areas have larger extents burned, kind of supporting that idea that it's that connectedness of the fuels that's important in leading to these changes in fire behavior and potentially fire effects as well. So good question. Thank you very much. Thank you.